Hey everybody, welcome back to the Fans in Motion podcast, uh, the only podcast that I think you didn't know you needed. I say to my two friends, you'll like this, all of our lives we look through windows, wondering if there's a chance we'll see. All of our ways and all of our footsteps <laughs> are leading us back to a reason to be. Say hello, Josh. All I see is some chubby faces. Aye. <laughs> Including myself. <laughs> In honor you know, of the the great Kelly Keggy himself, our reason to be, our reason to be talking to each other. Brent, what are your thoughts, my friend? You know, you have to you have to prove Josh right about certain things. He talks about windows and Night Ranger songs. And <laughs> and you quote you quote looking through a window. I you know, it's uh it's a good tune, man. Well it is a good tune. They do like their their windows chipping away. Faces. Yeah. What's the other one? Uh, Shouting out a window. Lay it, lay, um, is that lay it on lay me? Lay it on me. Yep. So, um, yeah, if we're missing any more window talk uh, lyrics, let us know. But what? Well, I think what Kelly's. A, I think Kelly's an Apple guy, so <laughs> you got off that. <laughs> what little research I do for the show, Josh. I'll see if I can find some more window lyrics. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I listened to Faces today. Faces holds up. I I like the groove and the. Ah. Uh, I have to go back and listen to. It. I was listening to uh, "Don't Let Up" today uh, on the heels of um, uh, who posted it early. Was yeah, it uh, Brad Sander? I think. Yeah, Brad. Yeah. I was like, now, nah, now nah, I got to go listen to that yeah. <laughs> CD. So. Yeah, it's it's what's great about Faces is it's got um, starts out with a good kind of heaviness, but then it's like a real melodic verse, and then it's got a a good heavy chorus, and then the guitar solo, like everything on Seven Wishes. It's just fantastic. And it's got, I mean, it's it's still got a little bit of that 80s touch. You know, it makes you, it takes you back to 85, yeah. but not enough where I'm in spandex and I got hair and shit like that. But, uh, yeah. Um, so it's all good. But, uh, yeah, Kelly Kagi part three. Yeah. Today. Um, this is. From the second interview we had, the second interview we split into parts two and three, this, it's starting to get, you know, we're starting to get to the birth of Night Ranger. Um, we, you know, we left off with Ranger kind of forming out, out from stereo. So in this interview, man, you get, you know, their relationship with Bill Graham. He talks about Ranger opening for Judas Priest, Ranger opening for Motorhead. Mm-hmm. So a lot of good stories there. Uh, they 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 get in, you know, he gets into the, you know, Brad playing with Ozzy and how they reacted and did they think he was actually going to come back? Uh, they the question comes up: Did they try another guitarist to replace the replace Brad? You'll have to listen and find out. Uh, we talk about notable figures early in the Night Ranger career that really helped them. Uh, we go through all those individuals, and we talk about some fun stuff, the odd jobs that they had um, yeah. w- working to make money while they're trying to get Ranger off the ground. So uh, y- you'll hear stories <laughs> about Kelly working for Jack's mom-in-law or mother-in-law, and, yeah. uh, and the best story or one of the great stories is – them writing, working on the second verse of Sing Me Away and all the hijinks that ensue. So you will enjoy part three. Yeah, it was really cool hearing him, t- like Bill Graham. I had no idea Bill Graham was not born in America, that he came from Russia, Russia, I believe he said. And just hearing the stories about Bill Graham, because Bill Graham is legendary in the business. Right, and to just and for him to be in the Frisco area as all as Bill Graham had already done so much for the '60s and '70s music scene, and, and continued to contribute, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we touch on it here and there, but I mean, think about being around that scene at that time with, with these bands all coming up, and you can just wander up and down. I don't know what the what 
street it would have been in the the, the Bay Area, but sentimental. Yeah, up in the avenues. <laughs> I guess it would have been the Tenderloin. That's where we would have been hanging. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit east of the Tenderloin there. <laughs> yeah, but you know when we I mean, touched on the connections, is, is that what you're you're alluding to? Well, no, just the fact that I it's a the, very... the scene. You know, I mean. Just, to kind of compare, like there, the, there was a, the Sunset Strip. Can you imagine walking up and down the Sunset Strip and just you could walk in and see Motley Crue playing, right, and Rat playing, and a version of Doc and playing, and just just they're just playing the clubs. And these are all went on to become legendary bands. And you know, Night Ranger, of course, uh, banging heads up there with um, Bill Graham. And what what was going on with them? You know, opening for crazy lineups at the head. So it's cool, man. It's really cool. Plus, you would uh, um, you got Y and T tearing up the neighborhood yep. at that time, and yeah, yeah, they're from the Bay Area, right? Yep, yep. Y and T, Journey, um, Huey little, Lewis, a little bit of the uh, the great, great Grateful Dead, and probably some uh, some Jefferson Starship at the time, and um, so. well, and, and well, Sammy kind of, yeah, although he was he was bigger, a little bigger at the time. Yeah. So uh yeah definitely would be if you know if you got a uh you know hop in the time machine it would be probably San Francisco 1980 then dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying Josh if you were handed seven wishes I would you would I would <laughs> you would rub that lamp and go take me back to the tenderloin district. I would just go back to 1985 so I could be the roadie that does the uh the samurai Oh sword. yeah. You know, so yeah, I forgot all good. about that too. You just yeah, said that was, that was great. <laughs> oh, we've we've got to ask him about that when we get to the Seven Wishes tour. I already got it on the yeah, list. I forgot list of- all about that. So, uh, so now uh, that's part. That's what's coming up in this episode. So, how was uh, the reaction been to part two for you guys? I've seen a lot of activity on the page, which is yeah. Just I mean, we, awesome. you know, every a lot of people in, enjoyed. They enjoy that it's not your regular canned interview, that we went down a lot of different avenues. A lot of people enjoyed hearing Kelly talk about his mother being, uh, you know, always there supporting him and the story of her coming to see him play when he was young and crying and, you know, getting the license plate when she was older and all those stories. A lot of feedback of people enjoying that and, um yeah, it's just people just enjoyed that it wasn't your regular tell me about Sister Christian, tell me about this, and then what's the new album, and that's it. Right. So people are enjoying the deep dive, and if they're going to enjoy this episode coming up because it just it's the same conversation. We just keep it going. Sure. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, comp- I'll piggyback on that, Josh, with um... – the, the comments that I've responded to have always been the same. People are loving how in-depth it is and how it is not the typical interview. And, and I, I just reply with the same thing to anybody. is like, I think Kelly enjoys that we're just letting him tell his story. And it's not the same. Like you said, it's not the same. So tell us about Sister Christian. What's, what was it like? It's it, And I think people just love it. I mean, at least that's the, that's what I've seen from people. And... Well, it's never going to be. We're never going to have the typical conversation with anybody, like the like the magazines that have to sell issues. We're we're going to have what we've always wanted to hear buried in those edited interviews. If they, yeah. if they even spoke about stuff. Well, what kind of like what Brent said is our, you know, number one, we're hardcore fans. I mean, we're the dedicated fans. We want to, but also. I like to dig deep into the youth and parents, mom and dad and stuff like that. And then us being the hardcore fans, you know, if most of the people that probably do interviews with Kelly, they're not hardcore fans. It'd be like, you know, someone giving me the assignment. Hey, I want you to uh, do an interview with, um, you know, some dude from Nickelback. You know, my questions would probably be like most of the Night Ranger interviews, uh, you know, like, 
why the fuck are you in Nickelback? You know, would probably be my first question. I, I'm joking. I you like know, Nickelback. Your name's Chad, but, you know, it'd be cooler if it was Brad. But, uh, but anyways. Regulus. So we're just, we know the knowledge. We know the history. So us knowing that, we know kind of what to ask and what's missing. And, yeah, listen, okay. if you're listening to this, you're a hardcore Night Ranger fan like us. And we, that's why we're here, man, to get all the cool Information that we have always wanted. So, um, speaking of fans, do you want to talk about the uh, milestone we hit? Or do you want to save that for a little later in the show? The milestone, well, the milestone of we hit 3,000 members on the Fans in Motion tribute page to Night Ranger on Facebook. Um yeah, it uh, just shows how many good hardcore Night Ranger fans are out there. Um, it's, you know, it's all to Night Ranger. I mean, we just, yeah. Yeah. just facilitate the page, and, you know, it's 1% us just basically running a decent page, and then 99% of the band still putting out good stuff, and the people that are joining and posting great material for us to look at out of collections or um you know going to the shows and posting pictures so yeah it's uh it's a it's a good milestone to hit it was funny i was going through some old posts and it was interesting to see the you know the post where we hit 100 or 500 yeah and, um, <laughs> we thought it was so cool to have 100 people so we got 3,000 people so thanks yeah, I think it's it's amazing, and um, I'm astonished. Like I, I've said, and I think we've talked a little bit off the camera with it, it, this is still less than a year old, and it just has taken off. And I I think it just goes to prove of the fans that are out there, they're, they're looking, and when they find it, they spread the word. And, they, you know, and, and again, I think kudos to uh, everybody who, who participates in this page. You know, they, they keep it active, which keeps us active and it keeps us going. So, Brent, you want to add to this? Yeah, I. It, it's like I was speaking to someone last night and they were saying how cool this page is because it forced them to go back. Once they joined it, I don't think they were, you know, they were just Night Ranger fans. It wasn't anything. They weren't listening to the old stuff. And it forced them to go back and reconnect with everything. And that's sure. what a lot of this has done. Because I know we have sold product for this band, and I think it's great. Yeah. And the other thing I'm getting, I, I want to tell everybody, most of you know this, but I, in the past two days I've seen, seen three or four comments where I love your music. Hey, yeah. you, know, we, you, know, you know, the band has nothing to do with this page other than this is our tribute to them yeah. and, and filling a void for the fans to have some place to come and express their stories, express their experiences, express their collections, whatever you want to talk about that has to do with this band, that's what this page was set up for. And if people do join the page and they think it's affiliated with the band, it's not long until they realize that. I mean, this is just a um, just a place for fans to gather. Um, yep. and, yeah. And that was a Tom, Tom Armbruster, and he... Uh, since listening to the podcast and following this group, I've actually gone back and li re-listened to all the Night Ranger albums. Some tracks that it's been literally years since I've heard. Thanks for relighting the fire. So, Absolutely. There you are. Well, and I'll tell you what else has worked for me, Josh, is your damn Midnight March Madness tournament is really... Um, you're causing some stress in my life, Josh. Uh, yeah, especially today. I'm actually abstaining from certain votes. Like I just I can't pick one, so I'm like I'll just let the other people do it, and I'll live with the results. It's, I, I, I can't, I can't vote against Halfway to the Sun, and I can't vote against Sing Me Away. Well, I was surprised. I so mean, I, I thought you're dead to me for that one. Oh, that's I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I was surprised Sing Me Away blew out Halfway to the Sun, yes. as it did. I thought it'd be like a sixty forty type deal, and I think it was like. 100 votes for Sing Me Away and 12 for Halfway to the Sun. So, uh, 
So, yeah, by the time you guys are listening to this, we should be out of the top 32 and into the Sweet 16. But, uh, but yeah, it's killing me when I see some of these, these comp comparisons or these ga- these games, and I'm like, shit. Yeah. And then some yeah. of my I have to, I actually have to sit and listen to both songs and go, all right, gun to head, which song would I have to listen to over the other one? And then, like, screw it, I'm not voting. Yeah. Moving well, on. Yeah. I think yeah, yeah, Josh, I think Josh was sitting there on his keyboard this morning going like this. <laughs> And he's like, okay, Mr. Happy Big Life, I'm going to put this up against what you declare your favorite, call my name. And I'm like, screw you. All right. <laughs> We're three rounds in. <laughs> yeah, know, it's tough. I'm man. not putting, it's like, it, you know, those are like, it's you're like, putting these yes. two songs together. I'm like, this is round three. You know, these, <laughs> you know, these songs weren't even close together when these rounds started and um, this is just how it ends up you but, uh, manipulated it <laughs> yeah i did um, <laughs> but uh but yeah um 3000 members so thanks everyone for that uh, with i guess yes. maybe the other night ranger news is um we'll talk more about it in the fans in motion news i guess but uh there were two concerts over the weekend in florida everything went well all five members there which basically means Brad was there, which Brad had missed a couple shows um, in the previous months. Um, standard set list, I think maybe Sentimental Street was left out of maybe one. Is that right, or is that a previous? What I read, it, it uh, was not on the list, but they played it. Okay. So, But uh, other than that, uh, the standard set list, um, which is probably going to happen because there's not a lot of, you know, they're just getting back into the, the swing of things, probably not a lot of rehearsal time. Um and then, uh, yeah, the new album is done and being, you know, basically they're finalizing that with, uh, um, you know, photo shoots and stuff like that. So hopefully this summer we will have some new Night Ranger. Hells Ranger. Yes. Ranger. Ranger. So that, that's it for Night Ranger news, right? There's nothing else, right? Uh, nothing we need to miss. Other than more. the photo no shoot they did yesterday. Yeah, Eric Levy posted a uh, kind of yeah. like a behind the scenes where they're, you know, doing the uh, photo shoot for the new album. So, you know, at this point, the album title is probably picked. The album is finalized, and they are putting together the, uh, you know, the photos for the record. Hopefully, a tour and a big tour book. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, moving on. Let's. Is there anything new? Anything new in any of our collections? Anybody have anything they've picked up, purchased, Brent, sold? Why, why don't you go first sold? on this one? You, I always go first. Process. Okay. Well, and plus, I never have the, the um, liquid means that Josh has. No, I'm joking. I came across this. I've been wanting this since I believe 1996, and I never bought it because it was a greatest hits, but it's from Japan. Oh, yeah. See the old Tower Records. Yeah. You know, label with the yen price. Very nice. Found this on eBay last week, and I couldn't resist it. I got it for 12 bucks, sealed. I was going to Masterpiece Collection. I was Josh gonna... said this. I'm sorry. Good. Josh, you know, was talking about how this came out when Neverland came out. Right okay. around that time period. Yeah, I never really told the story. I was going to wait till the Neverland episode, but hell, that could be years from now. So if you look on that, okay, number yeah. one, it's the only Night Ranger release with the 90s MCA logo. Yeah. All right. If you look there, so there's the, the 90, and that release was basically meant to compete with Neverland. It was released almost at the same time as Neverland. So here is Night Ranger coming out with this new album. So MCA wanting to make some money off of this reunion with Neverland put together a greatest hits in Japan Ah, to basically compete with the new record. So those were released almost at the same time, maybe at the same time. But um, Night Ranger was on Zero Records in Japan, mm-hmm. and then MCA Japan just put together that. So that would have probably never been released if they were not doing um, Neverland. And what's interesting is they literally went down the catalog. I'm going to read the nine songs 
that are studio. Don't tell me you love me. Sing me away. Night Ranger. All from Dawn Patrol. Then it goes, you can still rock in America, Sister Christian, when you close your eyes. Rumors in the air. And then to round it out, Sentimental Street, four in the morning, goodbye. Um, oh, pardon me. And to round it out, then, The Secret of My Success, only song off Big Life, and I Did It for Love off of Man in Motion. And then they included four live tracks, which I'm guessing are from the live in Japan. Is that correct, Josh? Yep. Which is um, Touch of Madness Live, When You Close Your Eyes Live, Don't Tell Me You Love Me Live, and You Can Still Rock in America Live, which kind of stinks because you've already got those four songs in the studio versions above. Yeah. But it's still a cool package. Big Life Era photo shoot. Yeah, Can't like, go wrong. Like I said, that was released just to basically compete you know, with Night Ranger getting back together and releasing the Japanese record so if you guys have been watching the podcast for a while you guys all know that i collect a lot of vinyl um and you? so yeah me so i already have all these japanese 45s but i got them for a pretty good price and they are all promos so really? if you look here you have the japanese don't tell me you love me which i have but it's the promo. The only difference is this. See that little rectangle? Yep. That rectangle says sample. So with that, basically it means that this is a promo. So the standard stock copy that you would buy in stores would look exactly the same, but would not have that um, rectangle there. So, uh, Rock in America, Japanese again. You got the rectangle there for the promo. And this was not released. Well, it was released as a single in the States, but only on a 12-inch record, where in Japan, Rumors in the Air was released commercially with a picture sleeve. So this is Rumors in the Air, B-Side Touch of Madness. And you can see that it's a promo as well and then what's great is the um the seller i got all these from the same individual had i did it for love cool but this one was not the promo and the copy that i had was a promo so the only stock copy had he had was the stock copy that i needed so now with these later on uh starting maybe with maybe with the seven wishes uh the promo won't have a rectangle but above where it says b-side right there there will be a square of japanese writing so that's how you tell the promos later on um, in the mca catalog so there you go i've got some added some promos to my japanese 45 collection i want to ask you a question you called one a picture sleeve now for most of us that collect records we know in Japan, Japan just comes with a generic sleeve and they just put a picture in front of it. So is it, is it actually a sleeve well, or is it just really a, a the picture? Yeah, it's not really a sleeve. So you show everybody what I'm talking it's about. It's just basically a sheet. Yeah, a sheet of paper with lyrics on the back and usually catalog information and, and other then, releases. And then the sleeve is this, just yeah. CBS, Sony. Yeah, it's so, crazy how they do it over there. I love it. Let me ask you while we're on this topic real quick, and a short answer, Josh. I noticed you store, I don't know if this is a collector's thing, you store it with the, the album or the vinyl outside of the actual sleeve. Is there a reason for that, or is it just so you can see the, the, the well, label and the sleeve, or is it protect the sleeve from being worn? There's a couple reasons. Number one, I would not do this if this was worth tons of money. I wouldn't leave the the record out like that, but you know this is a probably worth somewhere between twelve and twenty bucks. You know I got it for ten, um, but even with that, I keep it like this so I can see, you know, what it is if I want to. Because even though sometimes, not necessarily on these, but it is this, it could almost look the same. But you know things could be you know how they are on records. 
the night ranger can be on top or bottom so a lot of times mm -hmm. i gotta look and see if they match up even though everything else does so that's why i keep it out for you know being handy a lot of times i'll have a, a label on these just to give me information right. too but yeah generally speaking i will keep the the vinyl outside because a lot of times everything on the cover will look the same but the like on dawn patrol um the there's let's say with the bruce cone management label on there the all those versions there's some different ones because there is night ranger dawn patrol on the label on some of them is above the spindle Okay. Some of them are below. Some of it has Night Ranger above the spindle and just Dawn Patrol below. So there's all kinds of variations with the labels. So it's just easier for me to sure to look at it like that. All right, well, that's fair. I just uh, just curious why Brent brought something up off that topic. I was going to jump on with him. So uh, nothing else new. Night Ranger collectible in our collection. I don't have anything. Clearly, well, let's go to the fans in motion. Take it away, Brent. You got anything uh, to discuss? Well, we're going to touch back on the Clearwater, Florida, and the Orlando SeaWorld shows. I wanted to give shout-outs to Sarah Griffith, Dave Nadelman, Alan St. Germain. That's a rock star name right there. Yeah. Jim Coon, Scott Halibak, Barb, Herring um, Barb Hargrove Harrington, and Dwayne Vickers. I believe those were all the people that I could find on the page today that had went to the show, shared the pictures, took some group shots with the people, which that was really cool. I felt for all of us, for us, yes. us three, seeing, seeing the fans in motion and getting together. Um, I wanted to give a special, uh, well, let's see here. I wasn't going to share everybody's pictures, but I, I, I snapped a few. Like Dave Nadelman. Posted this good boy shot of Kelly Kagi and Jack petting his head. I thought that was kind of cool and needed to be recognized. And Knight Wanger handed out necklaces to people. Thought was really cool. And Knight Wanger comes back with his post. It's it's a bootleg, but it's what is it eighty? Three to eighty-five, Josh. I think the recordings are. All right, we are just totally pushing bootlegs now. <laughs> no, no, no. I just thought it was. I well, I, was really well cool. I, you, my policy was I would usually deny that. I talked to Dwayne a little bit, and made made sure before he I approved that that the quality was decent, you know, audio wise. Because I definitely wasn't going to post it on there if it's garbage. I just really don't want to post anything that the band's yeah. not going to get money for. But that stuff that's on there, the band is doesn't own and are never going to be able to release. So that's yeah, that's the reason why. But uh, and no, that's another reason why I talked about it too because it has the WEBN show that we've spoken about. It's got a Detroit radio show, I think, on it. Stuff like that. But you can find all you know. Don't give your money to bootleggers. I mean, unless you really think you need a physical copy of it, because all that stuff you can pretty much find on YouTube or it's out there. So, um, you know, that there's our public uh, yeah. our PSA. Disclaimer. The last, the last fans in motion thing I have, and I was going to comment on it today, but I figured I'd save it for the show. Tom Shapin Chapin posted this picture of Night Ranger. And he says when he closes his eyes and thinks about Night Ranger, that's the line. That, that, that's what he sees is the, the, line, the original lineup. And then ask, you know, what do we all see? Yeah. And basically, my response to that would be, I kind of see the current version of the band. That's what I've known for the past, gosh, how many years now? I don't know uh, how, when you're laying on your couch. Yeah, when I land on my couch, you know, think about uh, it. thinking about it. No, I mean, since Eric Levy joined, and, well, Eric Levy was just the perfect fit from the beginning. And then after Kerry joined, it's just, you know, that's what I see. Uh, you know, I, I think the lineups that I, that I appreciate the most are the ones, the current one, the original one, um... Well, actually, I appreciate them all. 
That's a safe answer, isn't you know it? What? If you you get really high, you'll see five fitzes. So um, that's what I he see. He gets high when he wants to. <laughs> but I never have, so I have I nothing say, to say. I, I wanted to comment on his post, and I couldn't find the still image that I was trying to think of. If one of the first images that always comes to mind, when I, even when I first thought of Night Ranger, is from the Don't Tell Me You Love Me video, where they're all pushing against each other. Oh, when, when the leaf goes in Kelly's mouth? Yeah. Hmm. And I couldn't find a, a good still of that, but that's that's an image I always have in my head because I always like that that whole the train track and the, the light coming at him and Jack on the the, the track. And there's that. And, I, and for Brent and I, a memory that I, I, that I always have of Night Ranger is Seven Wishes and that hand reaching up hmm. out of the uh, giant Aladdin's lamp and Jack just trying to find it. He pulls himself up. So it's just a great uh, visual I have. So. I would say if I had to think about it, it would be the uh, the pictures of the five of them um, on the uh, the uh, dust jacket or whatever for uh, Midnight Madness. Oh, oh I never told my picture. I'm sorry. Keep the, going. Uh, I'll tell you my, my picture, though. The five black and white photos, you know, yeah. in, in the album sleeve there. Um, just being young and just... You know, staring at those, you know, they all look cool. You know, Jack's all crouched down, and you know, Jeff and uh, Jeff and Brad both got the rock star guitar poses going. So that would probably be mine. Yeah, yeah. My ideal picture when I think of classic Night Ranger is always going to go back to two pictures: the photo session for Seven Wishes, and from the very first tour when they were, it looks like they were backstage and they just did about five photos of them all together. And they got their guitars in hand, looking like they're getting ready to go on stage or they just came off stage, one of the two. Yeah. I, the picture was just on the page. One of the pictures were last week. Oh, that's cool, though. That's a nice little, uh, I, like the, I like the thought. What do you think of immediately? Um and I always have that one picture, but the most recent picture I have when I did a meet and greet with him where I'm standing in the middle and yeah. I'm wearing my uh, T-Rex t-shirt that says World's Worst Drummer. So it you know, made me smile because Kelly got a laugh out of it. He doesn't remember that, but he laughed. He's like, that's pretty funny. So uh, that's it. Anything else for fans of motion? Nothing no, more. We do have a couple contests now. We're not. We're recording this, unlike the last intro outro was recorded like the night before we're recording this the week prior. So I said for the last episode that was just released, well, I guess, is it Thursday night? What night is this? Wednesday night, right? It's Wednesday. Wednesday. All right. Last day of March. All right. There we go. Still 2021 though, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, So we haven't given it 48 hours. Like I said, we would. So uh, we can't, we don't have anything to draw, but for this episode, I would just tell you to go to the YouTube page and leave a comment about what you liked about this episode. That's all you got to do. Go to the YouTube page and just leave a comment of something you found that you interesting in this episode. And from the John Haynes uh, stuff that he sent me, I will draw a winner and they will get... The Night Ranger, October tenth, two thousand and twenty, call sheet for John. Well, that oh, was it, that John had. Really but nice. This is the call sheet. I would like to have that. Well, you know what? Can you I know, enter? You can. Yeah, photocopy, photocopy that. <laughs> and well, these are. I mean, every, these were all photocopies. Uh, yeah. But no, you do not get Scottsdale, Arizona, two thousand twenty set list. Scan those that. things. I ain't scanning shit. Um, so uh, there you go. Leave a comment on the YouTube page. You and can scan that and give it away every week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this week. You, you can just, email that. I could just I could just type it up and just put a different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, well, here's the uh, here's Sea World, 2021. Ohio. Yeah, yeah, don't be stealing my Homer. Yeah. Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there you go. If you guys want some cool little Night Ranger stuff? Heck yeah. Leave a comment on the YouTubers. Andy, take us into part three.
Let's get it going, man. Sit back and enjoy part three of this intense Kelly Kagi interview. That was intense, Andy. No. How soon did you guys come up come up with the Ranger name? You know, God, I want to say, I want to say it was a, a few months mm-hmm. afterwards because it, we were using stereo for a while, but we realized that we didn't really like that name, and we did. I don't know, we did something like we picked it out of a hat or something. Everybody put names, and you know, we, you know, everybody picked it out, and it came out with that. I hated that name. I always thought it sounded like a truck driver, or, you know, or like, you know, cowboy. <laughs> Sounds like a bunch of cowboys, you know. Uh, you know, it, it just like it didn't hit me. And I, I didn't think it was going to hit anybody else either. But, you know, that's how we chose to vote on it is we put everybody's old you, name in the hat. Do you remember any of the other names in the hat? No, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the giant turkeys. The old Waldorfs. Uh you know, Lionel Richie, they did that with the Commodores. They said they opened up a dictionary, and whatever their finger pointed to was going to be the name of the band. <laughs> and, and his quote was, he said, thank God it was Commodores because it was very close to the word commode. Uh. <laughs> you know? So he was always, let me see, he was always thinking about going to the bathroom. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> no, no, don't, yeah. use, don't use that. <laughs> So, uh, you, you, so you did, so you're saying though, at the very beginning, you, with the original Night Ranger lo- uh, lineup of Jack and Brad, yourself, Jeff and Fitz, you guys did use the stereo name for a I, while. I don't know when, when it stopped. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I'm sure shortly after mm-hmm. we got together with that first jam. It was probably there. But your first your first gig, you said, was early May of 80, opening for Eddie Money. So you guys never played any live stuff under the name of Stereo with Jeff and Fitz. It would have been. Yeah, I think by then we were probably Ranger on that first gig. Okay. So, May of 80, yeah. So there's a demo tape that uh, you had taken a picture up and posted a few years back. Oh, yeah. Is this the demo tape that would have been recorded at Gary's between... Would you? Would this demo tape have been done before your first gig? Hold, hold it up there longer. Let me see. Back it up a little I bit, Josh. I think we did this after we were... Okay, after so... After we were long together. Um, so there's... It, what you're saying is there's it, another demo tape out there. Yeah, there's a there's an earlier demo tape of the, and I and I gotta say that I think Let Him Run was on, on that first demo tape. I think that, um, God, I I I don't think it was anything like Don't Tell Me You Love Me. It wasn't mm-hmm. anything. Might have been Sing Me Away. So it might have been Sing Me Away, Let Him Run. It might have been Thrill. Maybe. Um, that's a good question. And we got to find those uh, eight tracks because that will have it. That tape there was probably done at at uh, probably a year ago. Probably, I mean, I'm sorry, probably a year after. A year after that first uh, Gary Peel recordings. Okay. Um, done it um, in Sausalito at the record plant too. They gave us some some spec time there. So let's. So your homework, Kelly, is to find that first demo tape, and I will give you my address, and I'll let you know how it sounds. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about oh. let's talk about May, maybe fifth. We don't know you, but May nineteen eighty, yeah. the first show that you guys play as Ranger, opening up for Eddie Money. Walk me through your memories of that day. I remember that was the first day I, I met Steve Smith from Journey. Oh, wow. He came to the show. He lived up there pretty close. And um, he came to the show. And he had all these great comments, man. He was like saying, God, I love love your groove. And I was like, I was stunned, you know. I'm meeting this like huge star. And he's actually making these, like what I felt like was like comments, you know, sincere comments about, I, I, love, the, I love your groove. And then he started like the third song or whatever. He was like pulling out songs 
and so we were like, God, it's great, you know, M amazing to have have uh, all this feedback right away about it, you know. Plus, it was a competition. The, the first show was a, a, it was called Guitar Wars, and it was about, you know, the best band wins, and you win this PA system, and you know all this gear and all that stuff, and so we won the thing, you know. Um, it was incredible, you know, like uh, it, was a, it was a great start. But anyway, yeah, so that, that first show, I don't even remember playing it. I don't even remember if we were set up like Night Ranger sets up now. I was going to ask I you that. We set up on the, if I was on the side or on the back. I can't remember um, when that started. But I think that started when we did the Sammy Hagar taken to the people later on that year. Um, but... Anyway, yeah, that was the first first time I met Steve Smith, and you know, and he he was just such a warm, wonderful guy, you know. So after these are some other dates that I've found out there: September of eighty, opening for Gamma. Right. So. Uh, where at? Does it? Say I where? don't. I don't know where. Oh, uh, shows with them. Yeah. A lot of them were showcase. Uh, uh, he was playing at the country club in in uh, in Los Angeles, and we went down there and opened for him. I think we did that a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, just so we could bring all the record companies out. They had our demo tapes; they listened, they wanted to see the band, so we booked that a couple of times and went down there and played. Um, yeah, he put us on some shows. We played where else too? Uh, in the Bay Area, I think we played with Ronnie mm -hmm. once or twice. And I have a date. Now, we've David Lauser is pretty much a fourth member of the podcast. We've had him yeah. on so much. But uh, yeah. he, you know, he talks about taking it to the People Tour with you yeah. guys. Uh, the first date I have for that is October 30th, 1980. Uh, and I actually, I don't, I should have grabbed it, but I have a ticket stub from like November 2nd. Uh, you guys playing, opening up for Sammy as well. Uh, so I think my best, about maybe 15 shows, maybe up and down the West Coast, maybe. I think that's uh, oh, yeah. what I got. I'm not sure if it was that many. I don't remember it being maybe. that many. Okay. Uh, now, talking to David, he had said, that you guys were, and I'm pretty sure that's this is what he said. If I have to go back and listen to the podcast, maybe I'm wrong. But from what I understand is you guys at that point, when you guys joined that Sammy tour, you were already on the side of the stage. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then he brought up, you know, we asked him, well, is it because of the limitations of being an opening act and going against all the stuff Sammy had on stage? And he brought up that, when he was in a band with Fitz back in the mid seventies, that their band had a almost similar setup that Fitz had oh. designed because there was a Hammond keyboard that was basically permanently attached to the stage yeah. and it was at an it was at an angle. So instead of you guys both being ninety degrees it they it was more forty five degrees, but they put the drum kit on the other side. So he was it in the back or up front? It was up front. It was up front, just like yours, except it would have been just slightly angled. And he's always said that he thought maybe you know that's where the idea came from because Fitz was doing it in a band that they were in um, uh, many, many years uh, many years earlier. Yeah, that could have that that could be right. I I just um, what I did is I got it from Fitz. I thought it was uh, Fitz's idea, but it could have been from that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking that there's you know there's two great big objects taking <sighs> over the mm -hmm. space on stage. I mean, you know, eventually when we did when we did some tours further on in the you know our career, that became a a huge asset to have the, the drums on one side and the keyboards on, on the other, because, you know, we could just have the three guys could be in the, in the middle 
as the shell, you know, mm. as the movement in the shell. So, so, you know, I don't know if that was by design. It might probably was from Fitz, but, you know, knowing that there was going to be a show put on when you have 10 feet, yeah, you know, instead of 30 feet, you know, was probably a huge, you know, plus. Let's go, let's time travel. We're on that Sammy tour that you're opening for the Taking It to the People tour. Were you, did you have a sense like, wow, this is really good. This is really special. This is different from Rubicon and Rags and Stereo. Could you feel it that early? You know, not really. I, I couldn't. I knew that I loved playing those songs. <clears throat> and so every time we played those songs, I wanted to put 100%, 110% into it. So that that's all I was going by moment by moment. And reaction, you know, from from audiences that had never heard the songs. So I knew that, that we had a good a good band, you know. I knew that we had something special. It's just timing, you know. I mean you look at the, the whole thing of how the record business works and how, how many bands they sign every year and you know, seventy percent of the bands that get signed are waste. Mm -hmm. they, they never see the light of day. And thirty percent, you know, get signed and have some success and maybe like five percent come all go all the way up you know <clears throat> you look at it like that you could probably quit you would just want to quit but if you stay in the moment and enjoy what you're doing you know and start stop projecting like oh my god would you know are we ever going to make it you know uh, i hate this club you know <laughs> i hate the people you know mm -hmm. i mean all this travel is a bunch of bullshit, you know? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like if you get into that kind of stuff, you would totally, like, totally, like, cancel it. But I knew that I loved playing with these guys, and and we had something good, you know? There was something good there. Who knows if it was going to last or not? But, you know, we put every, every effort into it that we could, you know? Uh, and then when Pat Glasser came along, we had... That's when he started to really pull it together. Having, mm -hmm. having a good producer that's outside of the band that can listen to you and know, yeah, maybe we don't need that. Maybe we don't mm -hmm. need those parts. You know, let's strip it down again. You know, that's a, he was really good at that. Well, let's. I want to definitely talk about Pat. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to go to this demo tape that we were just talking about earlier. You said probably recorded a year later, so I'd say maybe spring of 81 somewhere in there maybe sound about right recording that demo maybe. yeah maybe okay. so I, doing those gigs mm -hmm. was in, in between we're probably recording you know so i just want to mention the song title and just want you to just tell me what you what you remember the first song is which is actually some people will not know this they'll think it's a new song is a song called hang on what? Yeah, um, hang, hang on never really ma made it, but it surfaced again. And uh, one of our one of our latter albums, the last few years. But uh, I remember writing writing that chorus, you know, and, and um, you know, it's just just one of those things, you know, like you're coming up with ideas and you're, you know. So I just remember playing. The one thing I do remember playing playing that for my dad. And having him get emotional about it, like you know, like he, that that title hit him, you know, like hang on till tomorrow, mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna make it all right, you know. That's what the chorus was, a simple mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. But he, he got emotional about it, you know. That's... So he, I thought, I thought that's pretty cool. I don't even care if anybody hears it now. My dad, yeah, enjoyed it, you know. So that's what, yeah, that's what I got from that. And that's got a be great as a songwriter i mean number one just getting anybody to get an emotional response from yeah. something you write but let alone your own father uh right exactly the second song is mr carry on yeah wow um yeah that 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 came out in a latter album too <clears throat> like the third album didn't it is that is... the um, Mr. Carry on, I'm the one to carry on. All right, so that, that's, that's, 
So that is the the beginnings of Carry On from yeah. the Big Life album. All right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. I mean, I, I with the Mister in front of it, I just didn't think it yeah. would it would correlate. Yeah. Uh, then there's a song just titled Tonight. Tonight. Would would yeah. that be Eddie? Eddie's coming out tonight? I remember the song. <laughs> but I think I, Phil, Phil Collins took it. I wonder if it has something to do with Tonight, <laughs> Tonight, Tonight. Yeah. Uh, oh, this boy needs a rock? Oh, I need a rock. I'm not sure. I'd have to hear it and see if it, there's a piece of, piece of it in there. Oh. Might be. You're definitely going to have to get these uh, demo tapes uh, yeah. uh, released. Uh, there, there's money in this, Kelly. There, uh, Andrew on that. <laughs> there is money. There is and, money to be made. The, and and it's all over, like, got to put these demos out, man. Everybody wants to hear them. I'm like, yeah, you and your... It's like, nobody wants to hear a horrible demo. Yeah, you, they do. You are wrong, Kelly. Yeah, you were wrong. <laughs> uh, the next track is... Probably a song that, you know, is probably one of the rarer songs out there a lot of people don't know about. A song called Sister Christian. Uh, God, I hate that. Never heard of it. <laughs> Never which, heard of it. Which we will get was to. It, which we will was get it Christy to, on there? Uh, no, it is actually Dark written Christian. out. Uh, it is written out, Sister Christian. Uh, which we'll, we'll get to eventually. But yeah. interesting fact that it was recorded before Dawn Patrol and just not put on that album. The next song now, there was it's no longer uh, out there, but there was a black and white footage of about thirty minutes from a May twenty second, nineteen eighty one show where you guys opened for Judas Priest. Oh wow! Um, it was out there for uh, probably a couple years. It's no longer available, but it is you guys playing about five songs. You're still Ranger. At the end, you guys, yeah, well, thank you, we're Ranger. Uh, but this, and you guys play. I think Eddie's coming out tonight, and can't find, you know, can't uh, find me a thrill. Mm -hmm. But there, this song is one of the songs you play, "Diary of a Madman." Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that one? That is, that's the song that I think I I um, referenced earlier, that the lyrics got pulled yes. for. Uh, Touch of Madness. Uh, so the that one had a, a riff on it that we thought, oh, that's cool. And, and it's really like, it's really odd riff. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. And then the, the 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 lyrics go, he changes by night, it's crime in the street, right? It's like dazzles. It's, mm -hmm. That's where those lyrics came from. Oh. Now, yeah. is that the riff? I heard one of you guys talk at one time and you mentioned that Brad always plays a riff during soundtrack sound check of an old ranger song would that be the riff <laughs> it's probably that. i mean because it does have like you said a unique kind of sound, guitar part i think it's that one because that one goes down and then we'll just I immediately break into it you know just the three of us everybody else is standing around going <laughs> what's that <laughs> and then yeah and then the other songs on the demo is play rough which ended yes. up on Dawn Patrol, Let Him Run, which eventually again ends up on Midnight Madness. And then it's not uh, Can't Find Me a Thrill. You guys have it labeled as Can't Buy Me a Thrill. Right. So a little bit of a a change yeah. there. Uh, the If you can yeah. remember, the versions that are on that demo tape are they like Play Rough and Can't Buy Me a Thrill. Is there a big difference between what's on the demo and what ended up on Dawn Patrol? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think we just changed some lyrics. We just tightened up the lyrics a little bit more and it ended up sounding better if you say I can't find me as well. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, uh, just, you know, it's like the, the progress. You know, it's like if you give yourself enough time, you'll totally change a painting, make it, it'll all be black at the end. <laughs> and you kept editing. <laughs> yeah, I just, want to change this and hit, just, you know. just a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. Do you, I'm going to get, ask you a specific date. Do you remember July 8th, 1981, opening for Motorhead? I do. And that was in that club we were talking about earlier at the old Waldorf. <laughs> the old and Waldorf I, keeps coming up. I just remember being, yeah, opening for them and having people spitting on us and shit. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, an wow. odd bill. It was like, 
was like, man, they were spitting on us. Well, you know, in England, that means they love you. You know, it's like, oh, get out of here. You know, it's like, oh, my God. But it, it wasn't I'm, – I'm surprised we actually made it through that show because that's such a hardcore audience. It's like, why didn't they put on a metal band? Now, you know, who knows? I mean, Bill Graham was famous for putting people – mixing music together. Buddy Rich would open for 10 years after – and but and and uh, and and ben, Benny uh, not uh, another blues guy. So it'd be like ten years after Buddy Rich, big band would open the show. Then it'd be ten years after headlining. It was like, what are you talking about? You know, um, but that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to turn people on. So I think he's, I think he still was trying to do that. He put us on that that uh, date. You know, when you were talking about opening for, um, what was the other show you were talking about we uh, we opened for? We opened Judas for Priest. Judas Eddie Priest. Money? Judas, oh, Judas Pri Priest. Judas Priest. Judas Priest, yeah. That show was the first time that we, that we saw Bill Graham go off on the tour manager for Judas Priest. Because he was this English guy like, uh, uh, take away all of their, all of their stuff. You know, uh, you know, keep in mind that Fitz was still very connected with Bill Graham. So he was a, a very good friend. So when the English guy came in and saw all this stuff that we had, like, in the, you know, the, the liquor and the food and this and that, he demanded that they take it all away. It's like, they're a, they're a fucking opening act. Take it all away. They don't deserve it. Right. Had no idea that Bill Graham was going to fight. For his artists, even though we weren't one of his artists, we were friends, but and we were connected with him. And we, you know, he was, you know, he was almost our manager at one point. He went down the hall, and we listened to everything he said. <laughs> I'm gonna, he was yelling, screaming, spitting in this guy's face. So close, like, if you ever do anything like that again, you will never work in this town. I don't care who you are. You get the fuck out of here. And we're just like in our room, like, oh my God. You know, we thought, we thought this guy was going to come back in there and kick us off the show, you know. But, but Bill Graham was fighting for our rights to be an opening act. You know, it was like, it was like we were like, oh my God, this is like history being made, you know. It was wow, great. I a, figured that show had to be a Bill Graham show because he recorded everything in those clubs. So when I when it was, when it was on YouTube and was black and white, I think it was. Yeah. I even told Josh, I said, "This has got to be a Bill Graham." Yeah, yeah. Thing. I mean, talk about. I don't know if you guys have written uh, read any of his history. Like he's got a, he had a book out mm -hmm. that I read, and just because I was so fascinated with this guy coming over as an immigrant, Russian immigrant you know, came over on the boat through Ellis Island through, you know, after the war. I mean, and then, you know, it becomes like the first big rock promoter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, started the club, club venues. Then he was the first one to bring rock and roll out of clubs into theaters, then into stadiums. Carlos, you know, he invented it. He absolutely mm -hmm. invented it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think he had a big, sure. big hand in the uh, U.S. Festival '83 as well. He, uh, oh, sure. they hired yeah. him to basically amnesty all those mm -hmm. things, man. He, he had to. <laughs> There's some interesting stories about how he got all those people to work together. It was, it was <laughs> oh. like, oh my God, are you kidding? Sting, Springsteen, you know, yeah, uh, you know, just you name it, Paul Simon. I mean, just it was great, great stories on that. But anyway. I want, uh, he, he knew what he's doing. I want to throw out some names that because the the time the the timeline during this this era, as we've actually talked about, Kelly is it's 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 hard to kind of you know come up with exact dates. So I'm just going to actually just go by individuals, and I just want to bring up individuals that I know were important to the early development of Night Ranger, and I just want you to just talk about how important they were you know, to the band, to the sound. And the sure. first person I'm going to uh, mention is Pat Glasser of Green Light Productions, um, yeah. produced the first three Night Ranger albums. Just tell us how he comes into the picture and how important he was to you guys. He came into the picture because he was an A&R person at 
uh, 20th Century Fox, which is where Rubicon got signed. So they had that connection there with Pat. Um, I'm not sure if he was promotion man. It did some promotion on the record, but he knew he knew the band um, from being signed there. So um, when we did some of the showcases, um, opening from Montrose down there, he um, came out to those shows and um, was a was a big big factor in like. I think you guys need to go back in the studio and record some of these songs and make them better than they're sounding live. Of course, we had a couple of disastrous shows, disastrous shows that end, ended up like, I don't know, the keyboards back then, you know, went out of tune, you know, I mean, it just, you know, and the lighting rigs went down and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of the record companies passed, you know, so he thought, I can make it better, you know, and then you can, you know, we can come back and revisit the showcase thing. So he was, he was instrumental in like taking us back in the studio, producing the, the next demos, um, and, you know, and shopping it and getting interest. So, yeah, absolutely. And then the, uh, the other individual is Bruce Bird. Right. Bruce I don't know if anybody uh, has any history that's listening, but Bruce Bird was uh, vice president of Casablanca Records back in the 70s, early 80s, before um, before uh, Boardwalk. So uh, Neil Bogart was the president and owner and founder of Boardwalk Records. He uh, and Bruce Bird was was second in command then, but they. They all came from the Casablanca era, disco music. They all came, and then Boardwalk was was um, was designed after Casablanca. And um, so Neil and uh, Bruce Bird were collaborating on. They, they um, Bruce Bird uh, brought our demo tape uh, to uh, Neil, and and Neil at the time was in the hospital yeah. fighting cancer. And he had like, I don't even know what type of cancer, but I knew it was it was terminal at the time. And this was, by the way, when Brad had gone to play with Ozzy and finish off that tour. We had been shopping the tape. Neil got the tape from Bruce Bird. Bruce Bird brought him the tape while he was in the hospital bed and a, and a player and let him hear some of our songs. And Neil Bogard, before he passed, said, Bruce, I think this band has something. I think you need to explore maybe signing them. And then two weeks, two, three weeks later, he passed. So then everything was kind of on hold and then on limbo. You know, meanwhile, Boardwalk was having huge success with Joan Jett. Mm-hmm. Joan Jett was, you know, on, on her first, I think it was her first record, second record. Or maybe, or maybe I'm not sh- even sure which record for Boardwalk. But I love rock and roll was was you know was exploding and so um, so that's how Bruce Bird got our tape to Neil Bogart and got assigned to Boardwalk. And so so Brad, so you guys didn't have a finalized record deal before Brad. Brad was with Ozzy. So when he went to Ozzy, there was. No record deal yeah. at that point. Okay. Yeah, we just thought, well, maybe, you know, and 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 we heard some of those live broadcasts over the radio when he was out with Ozzy, and we, you know, we just basically called each other and we said that, you know, he's not going to come back. He's going to be, he's going to do this. Why would he? You know, but but little did we know he was just a, a you know, a hired gun. Mm. At the end of that tour, they just basically just broke up the band, you know, released everybody, and Ozzy was going to regroup, do another album, and. So, you know, with that reality, um, you know, Brad said, oh, you know, I mean, it's like it looks like that's not going to happen. You know, so when he came back was shortly after that, we went into, you know, we had gotten signed somewhere in between between when Brad was still touring with Ozzy <clears throat> and we got the go ahead to, to do the album through Pat Glasser. So when he got back from the tour, we went in and started cutting the first album. And two guys that I was going to ask you about, but you've already kind of talked about Neil Bogart and Gary yep. Peel. Um, 
one last name I want to bring up uh, is Bruce Cohn. Yeah. Uh, now was he? He eventually becomes your guys' manager, correct? Correct. So yeah, he met this for five, five or six years. How, how does he come into the picture? He came into the picture with a interesting suggested by Bruce Bird to go check this guy out. I think he might be because he was managing the Doobie Brothers from the beginning. So he was always a Doobie's manager and maybe a couple of smaller bands. But Bruce got wind of him, I don't know, through the industry somehow and said, since he lives up there in the Bay Area, he lives up in Sonoma County. Why don't you go see Bruce? See if he, you know, was interested. So that's what we did. We went up, had a meeting with him, and and uh, you know, decided right there, almost on the spot, that he was going to be the manager. You know? Dan, do you think was when you guys signed him on as your manager? Was it before the release of Dawn Patrol? Mm-hmm. Okay. So while we were mixing the album mm -hmm. or somewhere in between there, you know, we decided, you know, we can't we can't make another step forward without having a manager. And that's why Bruce and Bruce was was so instrumental with our career all the way from the beginning to end in, you know, us finding Bruce. And then eventually Bruce Bird became our manager during uh, Man in Motion album. You know, so, um, and he was always so close with us. He was, you know, he he kept us from going under after a boardwalk went went down. We got back from the first tour. I mean, all that stuff. I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about that too. Yeah. But, um, you know, so Bruce Bird was so instrumental in our career. So, so important. I mean, you know, he he would come in the studio constantly, listen to progress on the albums you know and listen we'd play them playbacks you know stuff and get him all pumped up because you know he's the guy that's going to be selling them. so you got to get him on board if he's not and you know back to the drawing board you need some more songs you know or whatever go back and write some more songs you need you need a couple more songs you're missing that one thing you know you know and um, he was always so like right there in the moment with us you know so important and it's is and it's amazing you had all these important individuals so early in your career uh you know neil bogart with you know was called the hit maker and oh. the success he had with casablanca you know that's kiss and donna summer and the village people they were getting ready to make a movie in a, you know, about five years ago about his yeah. life and justin yeah. timberlake was going to be uh playing the part of uh, Neil Bogart and just having individuals like you know Pat Glasser and and Bruce Bird all those guys to have your back Bill Graham uh, definitely is you know just to have that is a, a good powerhouse of uh, management and talent and uh, and it was all just not even by design it mm -hmm. was just just you know that we were in the right place yeah that old thing you know you got to be in the right place you know I mean just unbelievable we were so fortunate and lucky to be in those times and be well, around those people you know there's two things that you've hit on this whole conversation it's your connections and being at the right place i mean everything just keeps i keep listening I'm like connection 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 oh my god this is fits another connection leads to this connection it's just it just felt like Fate had so much to do with where you were going to go, where all you guys were going to go. We had it to just... have that, that interest in the music. Yeah. First of all, it had to be the emotion and the, the right stuff had to be put in those songs. Even if the song wasn't, you know, the right, the right version or the, you know, some of our early demos had the spark that those songs ended up on that first album years later. You know, so it's, it was about the music, the right stuff being put in the music and then having those people go, yeah, I heard something. Mm -hmm. Can't believe it. Pass it on to them, you know, because they passed those demos on to everybody at Casablanca and everybody at Boardwalk, everybody was listening. 
you know, so we were so fortunate that that we we had the right vibe on that on those and we had the right combination and the right people, you know. What what was your personal life like uh let's just say recording of Dawn Patrol were you single, married, kids, what's going on there? Well, divorce, probably getting divorced for the first time and it was pretty chaotic but for some reason I was always able to to focus on the music. 100%, you know. All right, so you were you, uh, now were you were you a father at that time? No. I okay. Never had kids. I, I mean, I I, I want to say I adopted kids okay. later on, but I never had kids myself. All right. It never but, it never came out that way. It never worked out. You know? All right. But, but you're yeah. at this point you're you're basically going through you said a divorce during yeah. during Dawn Patrol. Um so Night Ranger was kind of unique, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong with this, is they were really not, whereas Rubicon and maybe Stereo playing a lot of clubs, you guys didn't do a lot of clubs. You f it seems like you guys focused on the songwriting and the showcases. Uh, right. You know, you, you hit on it briefly. Just uh, what, sh you know, you said you had some disastrous showcases. Uh how long? How many showcases do you guys think you did? And you know, was there ever a point where you thought you were going? You had a you know, you talked about the bad ones, but did you ever have a good one that almost got you signed? And maybe at the last minute, it just didn't work out. I think um, I think after we made those demos with Pat Glasser, we did a showcase in um, a rehearsal hall, so it wasn't in a in a at a venue. It was. And, and they did them all the time. They would go to SIR yeah. or they'd go to one of those places and they would set, we'd set up a show and then we, we'd play the songs live. And so we did a few of those where we invited all the record companies to come out. And anybody that had the demo that heard the music would be invited to come out during a certain time. So we did a couple of those, I think. Mm -hmm. And that got us, got us some, some serious interest. And then Bruce, you know, Bruce was like, you know, signed us, you know, he, once he got the, the word from Neil, he said, I should, I should definitely sign this act. I'm going to, I'm going to take over Boardwalk. I don't know how that whole business thing happened between Neil's wife and everything. She was involved in the mm -hmm. beginning uh, stages of Boardwalk and uh, signing new acts and stuff like that. She helped us with the design of the first album and um, so, yeah. So, but that was like, yeah. So, why you guys are getting, you know, building this up? You know, there are bills to pay. Did you ever have any odd jobs during this time? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, about the one I was uh, before Rubicon. Mm -hmm. I had another job. Where I was working for Jack's mother-in-law, um, uh, Shuggy. She had a flower. Uh, she she did flowers for some of the big hotels, and and they were it was in in the uh, the area of uh, San Francisco that was um, old older homes and mansions and stuff like that in uh, San Francisco, and she had this uh, reputation for doing the best flowers in San Francisco. So it was. It started as a private thing. So I worked for her for probably I don't know for a couple of years really? while we were to get signed. So I delivered flowers, you know, and did all that kind of stuff, wearing overalls and, <laughs> and de delivering these huge big flower arrangements to downtown hotels in San Francisco. So I, yeah, so I worked, so, worked my own. So you were working for Molly's mom. Yep. Yeah. All right. It was Jack too? All right. By the way. Because he wasn't working either. <laughs> you know, so he was, yeah, he, him and I worked there for a while. For, he didn't, he, he worked for a short period, but I probably worked for another six months. And then Shuggy would get me work when she wasn't, she didn't have any jobs. She'd get me work with the neighbors, you know, to go over and work in the yard and do all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, man. Uh, Kept some cigarettes and oatmeal. 
<laughs> well, you'll have to uh, you'll have to have Jack dig through the archives and see if we can see a, a picture oh. of you two working at the flower shop. Well, a good story about that. We were working for her, uh, doing a, doing some flower arrangements at the D Young Museum in San Francisco. She got hired to do this. It was a photo shoot for um, Homes and Garden or one of those magazines, right? And they did it at the D Young Museum, which had all these like old antique, you know, uh, furniture setups from the 70s. Like they would decorate whole, whole rooms to look like, you know, uh, 1789 or whatever, 1850 or whatever. All these like beautiful uh, antiques in there. And she got hired to do the flower arrangements for this one photo shoot. So Jack and I did it. We, we helped her, you know, load in and stuff. And we were writing um, the song Sing Me Away at the time. And we were talking about it and everyone, you know, when we weren't moving stuff in and he'd go, you know, I think about, uh, you know, he had a couple of ideas for lyrics on Sing Me Away for the second verse. And, um, and he, he said, so what do you think of this idea? And he sat down in one of those chairs that was like, a 17th century he sat down and was like the alarms went off meh, 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 you know? he sat down and was like suddenly she, she, and Shiggy goes get up what are you doing what are you, get off of that chair it's gonna break it totally forgot himself it was like yeah I got an idea for this thing. he sat down and set off the alarms <laughs> oh my gosh See there, you, so there you go. You get a uh, a little bit behind the scenes of how <laughs> the lyrics for That's... "Sing Me Away" was uh, was written. Yeah. Uh, so Brad goes to Brad goes to Ozzy. Uh, you you touched on it a little bit. So when he came back. How did you, know, you guys pretty much thought he was gone? So I guess before he came back, were you considering any replacements? I mean, what was your backup plan? We did. We um, decided to jam, not with any other players, but we thought, you know, how can we keep it going? I wonder if we. It, that that's a that's a faint memory. I'm, I'm not sure if we jammed with another guitar player. But it might have been with Jeff and Fitz and I and, and Jack trying to see what it would be like as a four piece. But that, uh, you know, don't hold me, uh, don't hold that against sure. me because I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. a real memory. I remember actually getting together and talking about it, see if, see if that would work. Because we really thought, well, why would he come back, you know? Yeah. Because we didn't really know how it worked at that time if, if Sharon was going to keep the whole thing going and. Was it going to be a, you know, a new, a new band, and you know? But it turned out that you know, uh, Ozzy needed a break, and it was, they were going to take a year off and work on. It. So he was like, okay, well, there you go, you know. But he didn't feel, and, and I, and I remember Brad telling me this. He didn't feel like he was a part of anything at that point. Yeah. He didn't feel like he was mm -hmm. like a member of a band that was going to go on with the history. He's, you know, he knew that. He had something with us, whether we were going to go any, you know, anywhere in the future, who knows? But he knew that by ha by having that gig, he could have gone on and done other things. They they may have may or may not have been bands. It might have been another you know hired gun situation. But yeah. Well, how fortunate was Night Ranger though? I mean, honestly, for Brad to be put in that position. Yeah. And to leave Ozzy, and all of a sudden, here's a new band, Night Ranger. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say featuring him. I mean, you guys were all equal. But, I mean, I remember being in eighth grade and seeing, I mean, before I knew who Night Ranger was, I would seen the MTV concert with him, with Ozzy. Everybody, everybody in school wanted to see that, to see who took over for Randy Rhodes. And then I see... Don't tell me you love me, and I and I go and I I buy that album within a week or two of it coming out. And I'm telling Andy, I'm like, that's the say, that's the guy from Ozzy. I know it is. It was. Yeah, yeah. You know. See, I mean, we look at it like, oh my God, we're starting a career with an unknown band with a big star. Yeah. That's 
in the band already. So he's already getting that kind of, you know, stuff and it's coming to us. It's it's filtering to us while we're doing the early interviews and stuff like that at all. I mean, you know, I can't say that it, it would have been any different, but I'm, I'm sure it really helped yeah. you because I mean, look, you know, I mean, that's a, that's where everybody was focused on is Brad in the beginning. And then of course, you know, they, they saw that it was a band thing and it was really, and really taken off in the song. So, yeah, I mean, that was huge juice behind the record. Right. And seeing the band at that time when we were when we were younger, when you opened for Kiss, I don't recall anybody getting more spotlight time than any other. It wasn't like it was that you know Brad got a spotlight when he did his guitar. Then it went over to Jeff, and then it came back to you. You know, I mean, the the thing was too is that you know we were uh, MTV. I mean, come on, that yep. was like huge. They only had like maybe 20 videos at the yeah. time and they kept like circulating all yeah. over. We got played once an hour for months. It seemed that like was great. It definitely pushed that into the stratosphere. We were so lucky that, you know, having Brad be a star coming into this thing, having the right song, the yeah. song. And then, and the way radio was back in the day, they'd play three or four songs from the album if they like it. I mean, that's, they don't, that's just unheard of. They don't no. even do that. He just cut that right out. That's a waste of time. One song only, you know. So, I mean, we were there was at one point they were playing three, three, three of you know different songs mm -hmm. from, from the album. Well, you know? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't want to. I won't keep talking. I don't want to. I don't want to jump ahead. But we, we were talking on the last episode about WEBN. You did the um, the yeah. studio. Yeah. You know when Midnight Madness came out, they were playing Let Them Run all the time. Yeah. You yeah. know, you know, all the time. I love, you know, that album oriented to rock was fantastic. Those stations were back then. Oh, cool. Okay. I, I, let's, we'll, we'll go backwards. I apologize. That's, yeah, we'll get back. well, that's, that's fine. I mean, it, it, that's, I think, you know, one of the beauties about that time period. And again, everything is a little bit of opportunity and talent and luck and, and all that. But uh, you had radio stations that would do that because, Again, jumping a little bit ahead, it was a radio station out of Cleveland that really broke Sister Christian. Um, so uh, I want to go back to July of 82. I think July's right. Do you remember signing that deal? You know, we, um, I do because we were in the middle of doing the album and everything, and so they had to have all the contracts done and all the paperwork done. So I remember, and you know, just recently we've been pulling all of those old contracts out because of our deal with um, MCA that turned into Universal and the fire that they had in 2008. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we, we started to re revisit all those old contracts and look at them, and it's like, oh my God, you know, this is like unbelievable. We still have this paperwork; it's like been copied 50 times. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean. I remember signing all that paperwork at the studio at Alan Zant's studios okay. where we were recording it. So. Was it, well, I mean, was it, I mean, to me, being a fan, I would think signing that deal would be something like, were you calling mom and dad or was it just, ah, this is just another day in the business? Um, well, I mean, it was fast and furious because we were in the middle of making all these plans and, you know, we were recording. So, um, yeah, but I remember calling him up and go, we actually got signed, Mom, you know, <laughs> a record deal. We're making a record, you know. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I mean, I just remember how excited they were, you know, when we were played those first couple of dates that they came to, um, which was not even a full-fledged tour. It was just a few dates at the end of, in December. Of, you brought it up the other day. It was December when we played... We opened for Heart. Mm -hmm. It was just the beginning of the playing the dates on that tour. I think it was the end of '82. Yeah, that mm -hmm. would be where the 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 tour uh, starts. So you signed this record contract. You're doing the record. Uh, do you guys have a logo for Ranger at that point? We do. Is it we look? Have, does it look like anything behind Brent? Yeah, right Brent? here. 
Look at that. Uh, <laughs> we've 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 all speculated what did the Ranger logo look like, and we've heard I think Jack say it looks exactly the same, just without the word knight or the. We'll probably put the. the above, you know, yeah, in the same kind of a uh, uh, font. It, it, you know, I mean, and we talked about this too. You could never find any of those, right? You didn't even think they existed. I don't think they exist, but. When I talked to Brad about this a year ago, he said that somebody in the Bay Area said that they had one. A well, copy of I'm not going to I'm not going to say the name who he said, but I uh, <laughs> check that out. Well, there there is like that's the version that that uh, that unicorn. Brent made. You know what it may have looked like if yeah. that was the the logo. Now I'm. I had heard what Brad had said um, and named an individual, and I know of the individual, and we're actually Facebook friends. Not, oh. you know, we're not like, you know, we don't know each other outside of Facebook, but he's a, uh, a musician who I enjoy, so he's a friend on my Facebook. And so I sent him a message, and uh, you know, I think we had talked a few times just about music in general. And I was like, hey, I want to just throw this out there brad mentioned or jack i can't remember but mentioned you having a copy of this and he told me that you know he doesn't now could he be lying or something i he could be but i don't think it's that big of deal to keep in the seek you know as a secret now the reason why i thought there was something there was he was a cat he was a boardwalk uh he was on boardwalk label uh, his one of his bands. Uh, Who is it? Is it a guitar player? Yes. Oh yeah, man, it? I'll, I'll I'll say who it is. It's Kevin Russell, who was in Seven O Seven. Of course. Okay. And uh, so you know, I heard was that it wasn't. I heard that uh, I heard that Kevin. There was another individual that that Brad was talking about. I don't think he was talking about Kevin. Right. Kevin. God, wouldn't it be nice? I mean, you know what though. Mm-hmm. Contractually, well, they'd have to destroy all of those. Well, there would be no way. When I heard really? Kevin Russell's name, that was the most I had ever maybe put a little bit of belief in there because he was Boardwalk Records, so there's right. that connection. And he could have, uh, you know, there's there's at least that connection. It's more than we've gotten sure. from anything else. So. You know, Yes. They sent you copies of every act that's on the label too. When you when you join the label, the mm-hmm. package that's got every record that they they put out, you know. So that makes sense. He might have a, might have had a copy of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and what we're talking about, if you don't know, is what Ranger, as Night Ranger is called at this time, uh, eventually has to change their name to Night Ranger, and the. The myth that is out there, there was 10,000 copies printed with the Ranger logo. Um, let's, uh, well, let's just keep talking about the, the 10,000 copies. So mm-hmm. I'm a big vinyl collector. I could tell you, you know, I could take out 10 copies of Dawn Patrol that all look the same. <laughs> They're all from the United States. But I could show you that, you know, the order that they were released in. So a boardwalk, uh, the first ones that came off the press don't have Bruce Cohn management on the back. So it'd be oh. a boardwalk label, but no Bruce Cohn. Eventually, boardwalk adds his management logo on there. So that's kind of the second pressing. The very first records that would have ever went out of Dawn Patrol would have been the promo versions. Exactly. And it makes sense because every promo version I've ever seen does not have the Bruce Cohn label. So, but every promo version I have is the Night Ranger logo. There's no Mm -hmm. sticker. And I have been looking at Night Ranger uh, records for over 30 years. These guys even longer. So, they're, it's just, if it existed, there would at least be one. Uh, And I've always said there's, there's either two things that happened. They were printed and 
every single one got destroyed, which I don't know. I just find, you know, with collecting Kiss records and Neil Bogart and Casablanca, that doesn't sound very, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't hold a lot of truth to that because there's a lot of stuff that got out. Uh, so either all of them got destroyed or it just never happened and maybe someone said it happened and it just kind of grew. It's a great Urban legend. It's a great yeah. story to have in the Night Ranger lore. And I hope someone proves me wrong that they come right. up with that record and uh and then I got to start, you know, draining <laughs> my savings to get it. Um what you know that is there any truth to that that uh, saying of like when a legend becomes fact for the legend or print yeah. the fact, or yeah, yeah, or yeah, with the legend. You print the legend. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah because it's more yeah. interesting. The legend, uh, more interesting. Uh, was that Liberty but, Vance or something like that? Or but so wait, so but Kelly, you've never seen the Ranger album, right? So as far as you know, it, you've never seen it. It's never existed. Never seen it physically. Never you know the story, it. but you're like, I've it never seen just, it myself. It's just, but the phone conversations were real about, you know, them finding out about the Ranger yeah. and. How yeah. we have to change the logo and everything, so it makes sense. It makes sense that you know that, you know maybe nothing actually really got printed. Mm -hmm. Maybe it didn't, um, because I know that it's, it was crucial at the time for all this stuff to be, to you know to be the timing had to be perfect. Like I could see why Bruce Cohen's name didn't make it on the record because they were like printing. Yeah. stuff to get out to record company uh, record uh, I'm, I'm sorry radio radio stations, yeah so that they could get their copy well and financially would that i mean would a re would a label do that just destroy 10,000 copies well it's cheaper to destroy the copies than to get sued um yeah they would do that because yeah, okay they wouldn't they want to protect what they have their assets and their, does that come out of your your pocket at the end <laughs> I don't think so. Did they be like, oh, sorry, guys. Uh, you owe us for 10,000 no, albums that never got sold. I'm, I'm sure it probably yeah. did somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So the story that's out there, and I, I think I might have mentioned it some, is the Ranger. The, the story, some of the myth is they're in the studio, and they're flipping through, like, Billboard, and they see this ad, this country band called the Rangers, and they're like, uh-oh. Anyways, this would pro this I'm ninety percent sure is the ad. Look at that! Look at that! <laughs> that looks like one of our record company. Uh, record that looks like something from Rags. It does. <laughs> yeah. Drop the end. Um, and we just are just a couple of weeks ago. We found one of the guys and and talked to him about their whole career and if they knew the night ranger parallel and how they fit into the myth. So now you, I think Kelly, we had talked and you had said that, you know, that may be some of the myth that maybe management um, found it, but either way you guys go, uh Oh, we're no longer can be called ranger because of these guys. God, I wish I had that hair. Um, yeah, that's a good look. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, what, so what happens? You know, do you guys have a band meeting, and you know, is it like okay, we've got to change the name? You know, do you have the lawyer checking out if anybody's called the old Waldorf's? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what's the, what's, what's the conversation? Is it just it that just, easy to go to Night just Ranger? Conversations. We just got on the phone and said, you know. We already had the song Night Ranger. You know, um, we didn't even consider that people might think it was like a theme song, you know. But the song Night Ranger was already on the record already. And so we just said, well, what about that? You know, um, and everybody kind of like said, that's kind of cool. You know, yeah. it's better, you know, than the Rangers. Yeah. It doesn't have country flavor that the Rangers have. It has a little bit more like a little more cutting, you know, well, a little more rock. So well, it's, that's how it was. An, it was an easy decision to go that way. Well, know? I'm glad no one was pushing for Penny. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, so you have the you have the the Ranger logo. Do, do you remember? Hold on a second. Yep. Might be important. 
my tour manager. I can get back to him. <laughs> Tell him you need to play Nashville. You're booking your shows. Right now. Uh, and do you, Absolutely. do you remember the first time seeing that iconic Night Ranger logo? Uh, I seem to remember it um, when they sent the final artwork for us to look at. It wasn't actually on the records. It was on a layout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember it. Uh, I remember looking at some of the early photos of it and like there were slides probably and and uh, stuff like that. But, I, you know, I um, yeah, that's about it. Just I just remember seeing that like it looked like Harley. Yeah. You know, and I thought yep. that was that mm-hmm. was that was the thing that caught my eye. You know, so is it safe to say you were happy with it? Sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that when uh, we got together at the boardwalk offices with Nancy Bird, uh, Nancy Bogart, I'm sorry, Nancy Bogart, I think her name is Nancy, that that might be wrong. Nancy, Nancy is Bruce Bird's um, wife, I'm trying to think of what Neil's, um, Neil Bogart yeah. I know it. I'm that was, come uh, to the rescue. It's, uh, it's Mrs. Neil Bogart. She, uh, she was instrumental in helping us design the whole idea of the laser beams coming down. Okay, that's where I was. And, you know, cause we, had, we had a brainstorming meeting with her. What's her name? Did you find it? Oh, I, I, come on, Brent. I, st- I stopped when he said Mrs. Neil, Neil Bogart. <laughs> Can you pause, pause the recording? <laughs> Neil Bogart, okay, here. It'll Wikipedia. This will be a nice edit here, Josh. Hey, yeah. it's, it's all right. It's, it, but what's great is just knowing this is something we never knew that Mrs. Neil Bogart. Joyce uh, Bogart. Joyce, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, again, Mrs. Neil Bogart, Joyce, as I. <laughs> affectionately sometimes Josh call her. shows his respect by calling <laughs> her Mrs. Uh, so, all right. So let's go into the design of the album. Who, who starts that catalyst with the satellite dishes? Is that something management brings to you or is that something you guys bring to management? You know, were you guys out in the deserts of Arizona doing peyote and you're out there with the yeah. big old satellite dishes or is that yeah, all of it? <laughs> <laughs> That looks cool. Let's do it. (laughs) So, um, I think in the beginning, so we had the song Night Ranger. Yep. We had some of those lyrics, and we had Eddie, Mm -hmm. who was this character that used to come to our shows at the Palms Cafe, was like a kind of a street guy. Then we morphed those two ideas to, to into an idea of like. What if there's this character that's like, he's the street guy, but he's like the, he's like the, the, the ranger of the night. He's the, he's the guy yeah. that protects the people on the street, but he's, but he's not a normal guy, but he's like, he's kind of like, I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, just yeah. a guy that cares about is the people that are you know, kind we of, just, yeah yeah just all ideas we were throwing out like the ranger of the night so what if he's like the protector what if he's like okay it could be eddie it could be like it could be like the night ranger he's the guy like a through story he's the, he's the protector so we were thinking in terms of like okay here's this guy that surrounds you and protects you so then then we thought okay it's this the, 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 and, the, and then it morphed into the beams coming down, and so somehow it got to that. It's like, what is the significance of the beams and all that? And and so we come, I don't know. So so it, it got kind of mixed up somewhat. But that was the, the I remember the conversations we had about the angel of the night. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and so it was that that morphed into this idea. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with the cover anymore. <laughs> we liked the way it looked. You know, we've got beamed from the sky. We're a bunch of aliens. We're going to take over the world. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sounds great. It's like, 
ideas just become more ideas and more ideas and they just stack on each other and sometimes they fit and sometimes they don't. But Joyce was instrumental in helping us design this whole idea of like, okay, once we got to the idea of like the beams going up and then we come, we end up coming down, yeah. you know, she was the one that said, said, let's go over to Griffith Park. They have, you know, they have this great grove of trees and there's a big, um, a big telescope up on the hill up there. And maybe we can use that. And you guys will be in the trees and the telescope could be the big, you know, the satellite, you know, so, mm -hmm. so it was like a million different ideas coming. <laughs> so, yeah, that's our that's that's our version of it. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we, we try. So when we did, we did an episode where we ranked Dawn Patrol, and that's why he created. Um, I love it. That's yeah, cool. whenever we do an episode, like I, I've got us on the Big Life cover, I, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'll do whatever I can to um have some fun. But I, I do want to tell you, you've got some fans from Japan that are on the Fans in Motion page. They not only tracked down that area where the satellite dishes were, they also followed. They found the dinosaurs from "Sing Me Away" video that you were taking we're pictures not. in front of and everything. They came from Japan to do this. I know. They. Uh, that's so great that they. Uh, I saw. I saw the dinosaur one. Yeah. They, um, now they're. Yeah, now I mean, they're. Now they're cursing in Japanese because they didn't know where this forest was and yeah exactly they couldn't yeah, do their park up on the hill there Los Feliz outside of Hollywood right? so this... is that where the observatory is yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah I've, okay. I've been there. The hill up there so you guys yeah. this isn't photoshopped I mean I know the lasers are but the uh <laughs> <laughs> but you but you guys you guys aren't you guys are actually there in the forest yeah. doing that right oh shoot. yeah because yeah, you're not cropped in the picture. Yeah. They put light, red lights, and they buried them underneath each one of our feet. So gotcha. it, when the flash went off, psh, the red light hit us. So that's why they made the little. Excuse me, but they made the little. Yeah. Like I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't do the red light. Yeah. I love it. That's, that's awesome. Kelly's like, hey, what a bunch of nerds. Hey, I, I even do the classic <laughs> logo. The first logo. See that with the... Yeah. Yeah. I got it covered, buddy. <laughs> you got it all going on, man, I tell you. Hey, it's fun. So this, again, this is a promo copy of Dawn Patrol. There's your promo stamp. And I'll show you guys later. But across the bottom, there is no Bruce Cohen management. So Not even mentioned? Not even no. mentioned. In the liner? So, nope. Uh it's not mentioned at all. So eventually, right here, um, you'll yeah. see there's three logos. Eventually, there will be a fourth one, and that would be kind of the second pressing. But all the promos out there, none of them have Bruce Co Cohen management. And, and these little icons here is one's for Boardwalk Records. One is Give the Gift of Music with a little bow, and then the other one is the RIA, RIAA oh. label. Who is Rich Bandoni and Leo's music? Rich Bandoni is an old friend of all of ours who worked um, at Leo's music in Oakland, where we would go to get all of our instruments, microphones, guitars. And he was he was kind of like a collector dude. That, and he was always like, dude, I just got this, you know, this thing. And he'd call us up. And so you got to come check this out. It's really cool. So, you know, there's a new drum set or... There's a new a new Stratocaster. Come over, you know. So he was the guy that that connected, and he knew all the guys from Rubicon. So before I even came along, he was a good buddy of theirs. But he worked at Leo's Music in Oakland, which is like the guitar center mm -hmm. of Oakland. You know, it's like the absolute pro uh, version of yeah. guitar center. So mom and pop. And then you think Gary Peel, and then um, is it Jim Alciviar? Uh, that's the other name on there. I'm not quite sure of. I don't know if you guys could read it. It's, yeah, yeah. it's Jim, and the last name is A L C I V A R. Alcivar. Alcivar. Okay. He was yeah. keyboard player with Gamma. Was a good friend of Fitz's, of course. 
We played in that band together, so he played keyboards with Fitz in Gamma. He was also um, a, an engineer producer that helped us with some of the demos. All right. So we did. We might have done a demo or two with Jim Alcivar uh, at, at his home studio in San Francisco at one point. So, yeah, he was a, a good old friend. I kind of lost track of him, though, um, 20 years ago, I'd say. I might have heard from him then. Mm -hmm. But it's been a long, long time, yeah. And then the other individuals you think, Ozzy and Sharon, Sammy Hagar, and the Bill Graham gang. And it yeah. sounds like they were a gang. Uh, <laughs> and Night Ranger was especially like to think, all oh, our good friends on the boardwalk. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit, and this goes into vinyl and uh finding, you know, where things are mastered. What was so special about, like, because I hear stories. Alan Zent, you know, the big room, his mastering, Brian Gardner, yeah. you know, what what set them apart? Well, I think um, their special set of ears to master an album because now you're taking all of those tracks and you're mastering them down to stereo two track vinyl and cutting it in into the actual vinyl. Those guys have a special uh, way of, you know, that's why everybody goes back to Brian Gardner or did and, and why everybody goes to, you know, special mastering houses because when the final product comes out, what they do is they, they are able to tweak even further the sound of the albums to the point of them being distinct, you know, uh, to being distinct to that particular recording, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what those guys do is they, they have special, it's really, I mean, it's really a whole art form and having uh, to master it. I mean, it's like, um, it has to do with, you know, they master movies, you know, how they mix movies, how they, how they master the final stamp on those, on the video and on the, you know, those are all those specialized things in the, in the industry that, and those guys, what they do is they have a whole set of EQ running, running the, reel to reel through this another another set of console and another set of electronics and just tweak it knowing how radio compresses sound when they broadcast so then they actually take that compressor that radio is that's a standard in the industry and they put it through that compressor to hear what it sounds like before they actually cut the groove <laughs> they know what they're doing and what they're listening to and how it's going to be finalized when it gets sent out broadcast. So, the, so those guys remixing are, it. yeah, I mean, Brian Gardner was hmm. definitely instrumental in mastering our albums, you know. When, the when they would make those test copies, would they use, would they put them on acetate records? Yes. I have, thicker too. yes, like almost like glass. I have yeah. an, I have an acetate uh, Dawn Patrol. Yeah, uh, I don't know where I got it, but it's. Uh, I don't think any of the mixes are different, but what you're oh, saying yeah. now, it could be different compression levels of it. Uh, if you have acetate, it's probably not much different. Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I would think that the only thing that might be different between the, that one would have much better low end because then when they go to the factory. They thin down because it's expensive. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. They thin it down, and it's probably mass produced. They're, they're basically a stamp at that point. They're not doing it in real time mm -hmm. anymore. They're just going boom. So they take a plate of the album, and then they bring it to the factory, and the factory yep. is just stamping these yep. things out. That's why sometimes you get defective ones that skip or whatever, and some of that. I remember the first Zeppelin uh, copy that I got of the second album. It skipped in one place in um, uh, Bring It On Home. And I was like, I can't believe I got a bad copy of this, 
you know. So I went, I took it back, and they they said, let's check this one. And then, sure enough, they had some bad copies of the Zeppelin, which hmm. skipped the exact same spot as mine did. So I was like, you know, it's interesting how they, how the, the industry grew out of out of uh, you know uh, into being more perfect, you know, mm-hmm. with this these and now it's downloads. But um, yeah, those mastering guys, Brian Gardner, mm-hmm. all those people. Yeah, that that acetate I have has two songs missing, and they're and the and the order is all different of the songs. It's just like side one is that night she sleeps and. I don't even know if "Don't Tell Me You Love Me" is even on it, but I just don't have, have you listened. Have you listened to it? I've listened to it, and I think the only song I, th- but I think it was in my head. The only song I thought had a different sound was "That Night She Sleeps," but I couldn't really tell you exactly what it was. Right. And and after I listened to it again, I think maybe it was more in my head. But uh, again, I just don't. I just don't know if there was some rich dude in California that had his own, you know, acetate. Record machine that can make its own yeah. mixed records. I just uh, those are those are special lathes that they have. Yeah, cut the grooves in those yeah. things. And you can only play them a couple of times, can't you? Yeah, they're yeah they, they deteriorate they quick. Had it right up front, so we were at Alan Zentz and they had a mastering room at the in the front room. So Pat, this is probably the reason why some of the songs were out of order and weren't. You know, maybe missing. They were probably missing some songs. Is because Pat Glasser would take, you know, uh, the mass the, the master tape and go up front and have Brian or whoever was up front. I think it was Brian was up there when we first um, went to Alan's place, and he would do a test acetate, and then Pat would take it home and play it. So it might have been. At that point, it was like maybe some of those songs weren't even mixed. Mm-hmm. So whatever he had on the reel, just just you know cut those because I want to go and see how the whole album is is shaping up. Mm-hmm. So that's probably maybe why some of the songs are missing. Mm-hmm. Well, there you have it. Another great interview. From Josh and Kelly Keggy himself, um, so we we get to the end of. Uh, I completely lost my thought there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just happy you pronounced Kelly's last name right. I know. So... I focused on that. But I lost. <laughs> I thought, where am I going? So, uh, we you you're basically right up to the release of Dawn Patrol. That's where we we left yeah. off, and I mean, think about it. We've got three episodes and we're not even at the point where Dawn Patrol is in the record bins. So that is what you get from a dedicated fan base here at Fans in Motion. Um you yeah, know, I I'm, was I was embarrassed because I blanked on Joyce Bogart's name. I've known Joyce Bogart's name since I was a little kid. Oh, and so yeah. when Kelly's like, I'm like well, Neil Bogart's wife and I'm like, oh my God, what's Mrs. her name? Mrs. You know Mrs. Mrs. Bogart. Mrs. Bogart. But um, how in the hell? Do you, who else is talking about Joyce Bogart in a podcast? Fantastic shit. Yeah. And uh, so next week we will not have a Kelly Kagi part four. Uh, we still got to do some logistics on getting that and edited and everything else. So uh, you'll have a break from the Kelly Kagi saga, but we shall have something cool in its place until we can get parts four through 42 done yeah. and put together. So, uh, so yeah. Um, and Josh, I want to thank you for Andy on Andy's behalf as well for your fantastic editing. <laughs> no, seriously, for the visual podcast to go back and see in those pictures, as we spoke about last week, it's good shit, man. Yeah. Good shit. That was it was great, you know. You know, getting with Kelly and fine, you know, like I said, it took us a few trial and errors, but when it finally went through and I got him, I was like, "Holy shit!" You know, it's like this is this is great. Some never before before seen stuff. So sure, yeah. Hopefully, we get you know that this all continues. And like I said, the most extensive Kelly Kagi interview you will find. Um, 
hopefully everybody enjoyed it. We will pick back up with, you know, Kelly and we'll get the rest of these out there. Slow burn, man. Slow burn. Oh, uh, you know, we we'll 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 get it and and in, in between those we'll go back to uh some other Night Ranger oriented uh um episodes. We do have one in the can that is really fun and and <laughs> and good and so uh yeah. You know what? It's a good time to be a Night Ranger fan. You yes, guys it is. you guys got a great Night Ranger podcast. Um you know, you got uh you got me. Uh you got Andy, you got Brent, but uh you got a new Night Ranger album coming out. Uh you got Kelly and Brad having some solo stuff in the can and it's a good time. It's a good time, you yeah. know, be a, to be a Night Ranger fan, so Sit back and enjoy. Yeah, and Brent, thank everybody. Andy, thank you for being out. part of this. And uh, Brent, you got any closing thoughts on this episode? Nope. Just thank you, 3,000 plus fans of motion, for participating on the page. Make sure you go to all the outlets to find the podcast. What would those outlets be, gentlemen? <laughs> well, you've got Facebook. Facebook is the main one you can go to to, to join the page and join us and and partake in just this nonstop yeah. cavalcade of hot Night Ranger photos and conversations and, 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 and fans of madness. And fansofmotion.com, where you can click on it. You can go to your Stitchers. You can find it on Apple iTunes. Uh, yeah. We're on Amazon, I saw the other day. Yeah, we're on... Uh... Six or seven. You got iTunes, yeah. iHeartRadio, um, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, Audio Mac. I don't know. There's some fucking other ones. Uh, but if you go to the website and go to, I don't know, I guess one of the links is podcast. If you go to the episode, there will be a picture, you know, the, the, the thumbnail and a description and then the YouTube link underneath that is the mp3 where you can just click the mp3 from the website and you can download the mp3 you know if it's your heart's desire to have us forever and and take us wherever you want so there you go Uh, i want to give you one more update somebody asked me the other day about the shirts how they could get a shirt well yours truly just mastered on how to make shirts on websites without any white around them whatsoever. All these websites are tough to do. I took a YouTube course last night. <laughs> We're almost open for business. There you go. So the uh, the two people that are interested in Fans in Motion t-shirts get a hold Josh and Andy. of Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching. Check us out on YouTube. Bye. We're going to play you a song on our very first album. Came right off that very first album, Dawn Patrol, back in 1982. Now, we used to play a small club on Polk Street in San Francisco, California. This club was called the Palms Cafe, right? Held about 60, 70 people, maybe tops 80. And we used to play in there all the time, and other bands would come and see us, and Brad would jump up and down, run up and down the bar, and kick over beers and stuff like that. And